Hello and welcome. My name is Philip F. Napoli. I'm a 20th century U.S. historian here at Brooklyn College City University of New York. In September of 2017, Ken Burns premiered his Vietnam War epic, an 18-hour film about the American War in Vietnam. In talking to Vietnam veterans from the New York City area, it became clear to me and I think to many others that American women were inadequately represented in the film. So here at the college, we decided to offer them a platform, an opportunity to reflect on what Vietnam meant to them, both in the 1960s, during their time of service, and through to today. So we try to let them know with our leaflet. During the Vietnam War, Dr. Jeannie Christie served as a civilian volunteer with the American Red Cross, a donut dolly, between 1967 and 1968. The donut dollies were made up of 627 young American women, all volunteers, all college graduates, whose job it was to go to Vietnam, very often to frontline combat positions, and meet with equally young American servicemen to help them forget about the war. They were there to provide a morale boost, a vision of home. In a 1986 interview with the Washington Post, Dr. Christie said, the boys were like my brothers. You'd be with them laughing and playing games in the morning, then they'd be blown to pieces in the afternoon. The effects of her time in Vietnam have stayed with her to this day. Please meet Dr. Jeannie Christie. The title is, give it, give it to me. It's a, it's Supplemental, Supplemental Recreational, Recreational Activities Overseas, right. better known as SRAO. SRAO, see that's, yes. Yeah, that's and if you really wanted to insult the grand matron of the Red Cross program at that moment, you said you were a donor dolly. She hated it. She absolutely hated to have us be called donut dollies. What's the association? Why? Well, she was World War II, and the donut dollies were World War II. We suspect there were other reasons that were going on, and she just thought it was a very demeaning title. Mm -hmm. So we were to be called SRAO girls. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever called us SRA. Right. They all called us Donald Dollies. The program existed in Vietnam from about 65 to 72. Mm -hmm. right? How many women went through the program? 627. Oh my God, under a, in total. Under a thousand. Yeah. yeah. Over those seven Three years. were killed. And um, each year was different. You talk to 627 of us, you'll get 627 different stories. Mm -hmm. They're all very different. Everybody had a different experience. You're there from 67 to 68 in Nha Trang, is that correct? No, it was Nha Trang, Da Nang, and Phan Rang. Ah, right, three different locations. Three different locations. Uh -huh. How would you describe or characterize the job of the SRAO in Vietnam? It was psychological health and welfare. That's the easiest way I can put it to anybody, mm -hmm. is to explain what it was. Okay. Um, it, the premise was easy. If you could get them to laugh, they couldn't cry. And sometimes you would show up and they were very angry. I understood paragraphs of words that started with F. Uh, I knew the innuendos of all of them. Um, but we learned a lot on how to deal with men that were that stressed and that much under pressure. When we first started out, we learned very quickly not to confront somebody. Mm -hmm. Not to sit like we are. We always sat next to them. It immediately diffused the situation. They could talk to us like a buddy as opposed to a therapist. Mm -hmm. um, or we represented their wives, their sweethearts, their mothers, you know, the people back home. And things at home weren't always great. So if we sat next to them, they would talk to us. And we had no answers. We had no answers to them. Which was really sad because, you know, if you're a nurse, you have something you could heal and you can fix. We couldn't fix anything. We couldn't do anything like that. I want to talk about the, the public representation of donut dollies, of American women who went to Vietnam. So I kind of want to hear you tell me, talk to me a little bit about the way women have been treated in the years since. Since uh, we've come a long way, baby, as the expression goes. Because our game, wa our job was fun and, fun and games, we were the airheads. We weren't serious. The nurses hated us at the time being. We've become good friends now, but they didn't understand that our job was to make people laugh and smile. Mm -hmm. So the perception was that we were airheads. Um, we were deadly serious. We knew what we had to do. 
And um, to come back and find people saying, we know what women did in Vietnam. The end of the conversation. It's over with. There'll be no dialogue. Because I couldn't change people's minds. They had no idea. And we changed history. It really broke the standards. It broke, I, I was expected to graduate from college, get married and have babies. Sure. I, I wasn't ready for that yet. And it took a long time for other women to realize they had a life. They don't have to do that. They could go to work. They had careers that they could have. Mm -hmm. They could make a way in the world. And they didn't have to fit that you know, old standard. As I said, we've come yeah. a long way. We've yeah. come a long way. Susan O'Neill arrived in Vietnam in 1969 and served at the 22nd Surgical Hospital in Phu Bai, and then at the 12th Evacuation Unit at Ku Chi, a big, busy hospital near the southern capital, Saigon. What I find so remarkable about Sue is the fact that she has a very clear-eyed view of her role in Vietnam. In her book of short stories entitled Don't Mean Nothing, Short Stories of Vietnam, she writes, Female veterans served in a war that was substantially different from the one fought by male soldiers. Male soldiers lived surrounded by blood and death in which they had a direct stake. We faced the daily onslaught of maimed and dying men, women, and children dropped on us by helicopter from an alien world. We asked Sue to talk about her Vietnam experience. Please meet Susan O'Neill. I have met so many people who had no idea we were over there. And now, because women are combatants, they thought we were over there as combatants, if I say that I was in Vietnam. There's, no, there's very little clear uh, delineation that we had a role there. And we were such a, a small part of the total population that I think that even the Army kind of did that. They kind of said, hey, you know, we don't have to, because they can't give you official figures of how many of us were over there. Yes. And the claim is, you know, the records thing burned down. It's, which I think is the equivalent of, you know, the, the dog ate my homework. So uh, Sue, start us off. Tell us a little bit about um, your enlistment story. How did that come about? Um, I was young and dumb. And I lived in Indiana, and uh, living in Indiana, I found tremendously boring. Uh, but I was, I was in one of those three-year nursing schools, which were uh, kind of the cheap education for lower middle class young ladies, particularly if they were Catholic. And I was kind of falling out of my Catholic faith, so there was that going on. Uh, but uh, I happened to have this friend who was kind of political spectrum 180 degrees away from me. I was going to protests. I was tremendously anti-Vietnam. I played guitar badly and I'd, I'd sing in coffee houses and do protest and that sort of thing. And she happened to be going to Chicago to be recruited because everyone in her family had been a military person at some point. So she asked if I'd like to go along. She had one of the few cars on campus. And I thought, eh, if we can in, uh, in Chicago, that would be fun. I kind of like to be in, in drama and that sort of thing. And I thought, you know, this is like the ultimate playing against type. And wouldn't everybody at school be just amazed and, and blown away by the fact that I had uh, joined the army? I, you know. Come clean for Jean. I was in the, the Jean McCarthy movement, the whole nine yards. That's, that's a lot of interesting cachet there. The scale of the injury, the type of injury you saw was pretty profound. Can you talk to us more about the type of training that you got? Did, I mean, do you, did, did they simply expect you to walk in as a professionally competent nurse otherwise? Did, did they give you other medical training other than the... We had a guy and I was kind of an assistant on this and he was on a gurney outside the... Uh, the OR and he looked perfectly fine and he was even speaking and you know we held a brief conversation and uh, then I took him in and he kind of went off to sleep it looked like and I was prepping his uh, prepping his abdomen because he had a little shot right almost in his sternum and um, the docs came in and they, the anesthesia guy hooked him up and saw that his, his vital signs were just a mess. And he said, we have no time. And the, the surgeons came in and they just threw some betadine scrub on him and they said, we can't even shave him, you know, just stop that, just get whole, a whole lot of units of blood. And so I ran out and I got a huge number of units of blood and put them in, into the cooler, which sits beside the guy who's giving the anesthesia. And we hooked him up to all kinds of, uh, you know, each extremity had a, a blood um, bag. And that's kind of, that was my 
literally my baptism in blood because ultimately a tech that we had who was should never have been there or in the military or you know anywhere near a medical scene just, just because he he couldn't process it um, squeezed the blood bag uh, there's a bag you put around the blood bag that uh, like a sleeve and it squeezes it as you go it looks like an old-fashioned blood pack blood uh, pressure cuff and he squeezed it so hard he burst the thing and it just went all over the place and at that point everyone knew that this kid was not going to make it but they had been trying and trying and trying to get him going for about two hours at that point you know every time he kind of fell off the cliff with his uh, vital signs they would work on him and work on him and work on him and actually I'd, I'd see they his heart was just a mess and the reason that I hadn't seen that because I was young and dumb and I hadn't seen that level of trauma before but this was the first time I saw such massive internal damage from one bullet and it really brought it home to me and I, I just you know after we scrubbed down the which took us the rest of the day after we scrubbed down the uh, the operating room uh, from the blood that it spattered everywhere like spray paint it was just crazy um, I came out and they were putting the flag to bed because it was uh, it was time you know to, to lower the flag and there was a small ceremony going on you know several feet away and I remember looking at that flag and saying you know this uh, doesn't represent you know the guy who broke the blood bag and it doesn't really represent the kid. It doesn't seem to represent anything, but people are are waging war under it to, with folks who really are not our enemy, not inherently, or not any good reason that they'd be our enemy. And here we are on their territory doing this, and I just can't do that. So I haven't saluted the flag since then. I still have not. I'll stand, and I won't make a big thing out of it, but I won't salute the flag. Today we've had the opportunity to listen to the recollections of two American women who served in Vietnam. It seems important to me that we as a country recognize that there wasn't a single story out of Vietnam, there were many. And that we understand that war and service abroad can have a profound impact on a person's life.